Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership series. I'm your host. My name is Scott Miller and each week I have the honor and the privilege of being able to interview a different thought leader, someone in the space of leadership development. We've been privileged to interview four-star generals, Pulitzer Prize winning authors, experts, and CEOs that are all focused on building a winning culture inside organizations. Now, we all know that leadership starts with yourself. You cannot lead other people unless you are able, capable, willing to lead yourself, which is why today our guest is perhaps not a household name in the corporate arena, but a household name in every house in America and the world. Our guest today is Matthew McConaughey, the author, author of this remarkable book that is taking the book world by storm, Green Lights. Matthew McConaughey, welcome to On Leadership. Scott, good to be here. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Matthew, I get the sense that I might be interrupting something more fun than just podcast. What's going on? You look like maybe you, have you been surfing recently? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't. Actually, you're not interrupting to anything too much fun. I actually just got surgery on my knee. I tore my meniscus, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm limping for the next few days. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm not doing too much too fun. Uh, this is a good place for me to be right now. <laughs> well, we're grateful you're here. We wish you well. Uh, you are a household name for your philanthropy, for your dedication, for your model of self-leadership, your Academy Award winning actor. My three sons, who are six, nine, and ten, are so excited that I am interviewing today Buster Moon. Yes. Because they love Buster Moon, the most famous koala on movies. Of course, Buster Moon is the executive producer of the famous movie Sing. They have no idea about any of the rest of your movies, but man, they are in love with Buster Moon. Tell us, why does someone of your sort of stature choose to be the voice behind a cartoon character in a movie like Sing? Why does that appeal to you? Sure, well, for starters, you know, I kept getting asked the question, so which of your which of your movies are your children's favorites that you've done? And I, every every time my answer was like, I haven't made any movies they can see yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, this this illumination, uh, Chris Meldani came to me with the with the offer to be the voice of Buster Moon and seeing I read the script. I, lo I really liked it. it. Looked like a lot of fun. I like doing voices anyway. And I was like, yes. This is something I can do, it's something my kids can finally see. Um, so we did the first one. I also did Kubo and the Two Strings, which was, the, was another really nice animated uh, feature. And um, are we just now finishing up on the second Sing, um, Sing 2? And uh, it's, it's a whole lot of fun. It's, uh, you can, you can uh, you can show up and do the work in your pajamas if you want, um, but it's really interesting the process of how, how they make it. They have a they have a camera recording you as well to pick up your annotations or your or your motions or your or your actions, and they'll integrate those physically into the animated character as well. Um, it can be the smallest thing as a as an eyebrow lift, and they'll integrate those into the character. Um, but it's just you go in, you press the tape, you record, and you can't mess up even if you try. Matthew, uh, that soundtrack has permeated the, the sound of our home for several years now. It's on almost loop, I hate to admit, but my boys are big fans of Buster Moon. Thanks for joining us um, in all the movies that you have contributed. I want to talk about leadership today, specifically the yes. book that you've just written, which continues to be one of the top one or two books sweeping every list across the nation. It is not uncommon to have a Hollywood celebrity, an actor, an actress, a producer, to you know, author a book and it hits the list and it's off a week later. Your book continues to be one of the top two selling books on every list in America right now, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Amazon. The book is sold out on Amazon, sold out. I had to well, go to Barnes and Noble. I had to go to Barnes and Noble and I bought the okay. last two copies here in Salt Lake City. So I'm sure they're fixing that problem. I, I wanna talk a bit I about the so. book. Matthew, you open it and you say, I never wrote things down to remember. I always wrote things down so I could forget. This book is a fascinating, if somewhat episodic collection of stories of your life where there are deeply embedded lessons in each one. What did you mean by you wrote things down so you could forget? So I've always sort of had a, I've never been one that sat aside time to go, oh, 
from 2 to 3 p.m. or from 9 to 10 p.m., I'm going to go write in my journal. Um, I always have my journal on me. Uh, when I would go out to dinner, I have my journal on me. Now I have my phone and uh, it, it's, it's, I take notes there 24-7. Um, I wake up in the middle of the night, uh, an idea. I'm going to, it's right there. I write it down. So I noticed, um, you know, if you're out with a group, somebody says, say right now, you and I are talking and you say something like, oh man, I like that. I think that idea is scalable. I think that line sort of encompasses an, an applicable idea that I want to uh, deconstruct later on. I want to write it down now because I find if I don't write it down now, through this conversation, I'm going to be mentally reminding myself, don't forget that line. Don't forget what he said. Don't forget what he said. And so now I'm not 100% with you. If I'm, if I'm playing grab, um, grab my backside with my thoughts about, please don't forget that. Don't forget that. Don't. Forget. So I always like to write it down right away. And I'll, it happens all the time at dinners. I have to remind people, hey, guys, I'm not writing somebody who's not here. I'm actually writing something down that you just said that inspired me. And I'll finish it. And then I'll hand it to the person and go, will you sign that if that's what you said? and they sign it and um, that, that way, then I can forget it because I know uh, I can be present in the conversation that I'm in, present at the dinner I'm at, present at doing whatever I'm doing. And later on tonight, when I get home, I can then go into that and deconstruct that or tomorrow or next week and I can expound on that idea. So that's why I'm saying I write things down so I can forget them. Yeah, clear some space out of your brain, right? For the next big yes, idea. Yeah. exactly. Matthew, the book is called Green Lights, and uh, on the inside, you know, front cover here, it actually is a green light, and it's kind of both metaphorical and literal. Uh, I've been reading this book for several weeks now, and I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, and if you've been to Salt Lake, you know that the entire city is on a grid pattern, and everything kind of con you know, converges around the capital. And mm -hmm. about seven blocks east of the capital of Salt Lake City, there is a road called 7th East. Not very inspirationally named, but it's 7th East. And this road goes about four miles north and south. I don't know, about maybe 25 blocks or so. And if you time it exactly right, if you go the speed limit, if you start at the very first block, you can make it all the way through all 25 blocks, all about 17 lights, without stopping. You hit every green light perfectly. I've done it twice in my life. But the okay. last couple of weeks I've been thinking about you because in essence, 7th East and Salt Lake City is a metaphor for your book. It's around hitting green lights and knowing kind of getting your groove and your yes. rhythm. And whenever I hit these green lights now, I always think of you. Tell me why you titled the book Green Lights and what does that mean to those last sure. few people who haven't read it yet? Sure, so, so green lights are it's a metaphor for things in our life. Uh, green lights mean go, you know, they affirm our way. Proceed, please, more. Onward, yes, freedom. Um, we like them because they do all those things. They're easy. They're like a shoeless summer in that way. We are on frequency when we're catching our green lights. Yellow and red lights slow us down or make us stop. They're hardships or crises that we have in our life, times for introspection or what have you. We don't really want them. We don't really like them because of those reasons, but we usually find out that we needed them for some reason. Um, thirdly, I, I understand that uh, in looking through the last 50 years of my life in journals, I noticed that I engineered green lights in my future uh, with great deliberation and intentionality, meaning I took responsibilities or sacrificed things today in ways that teed me up for more freedom tomorrow teed me up for more possibility to succeed tomorrow, teed me up for less stress tomorrow, all the way down to people who go, uh, you know, what's a simple one? And I go, well, look, here's a very simple one. Put your coffee in your coffee filter the night before you go to bed. So when you get up in the morning, all you got to do is press the button. That's being kind and cool to your future self. That's creating a green light in your future. Now, yes, you can engineer, but then sometimes green lights just fall in our lap and there's no reason behind it. We have no idea why we got fortunate at that time, but hey, let's do something with it and take advantage of that right now. Um, the final sort of uh, metaphor is that all the yellows and reds, those ones that we don't, may not want, but find out we need, they do eventually turn green in the rear view mirror of life. Meaning we, the, we'll have a lesson we're supposed to learn in that red and yellow light that we may realize it when we're in it, 
We may not realize it till next week, next month, next year. We may not realize it till we're on our deathbed. I even venture to say that some of our red and red and yellow lights will not reveal their green light assets until they our great great grandkids understand the lesson that was to be learned. Um, the other the other thing is the real green light, and a, a friend of mine brought this up, comes in the art of what do you do at the yellow light, because. Sometimes we get that yellow light and it's like, yes, slow down. I need a red light. I need some real introspection here. Other times we should approach a yellow light and look at that crisis and go, you know what? That's a little bitty molehill. I'm not going to give that crisis credit. I'm not going to slow down for that. I'm not going to, because if you dwell on that yellow light, you're going to end up in a red. Sometimes we just need to put the pedal to the metal and say, I'm not slowing down for this one. It's not worth my time. You could argue that Green Lights is a parenting book, right? It's a book, like sure. you say, on how to be kind, how to hurt less, how to be hurt less, how to mm. be more generous. I also think it's a leadership book because we know from our own expertise at Franklin Covey in leadership that you can't lead other people until you have a vision for your life. You have a plan yes. for your life. You know how to identify green lights in your own life. Why did you write the book? I wrote the book because... I wanted a more direct line to communicate. I, had, I wanted to take the dare that I'd been daring myself to go actually go back and understand my lineage, to look back at the last 50 years of my life, which is something I was very fearful of doing. I'm not one for, for looking back. I'm always like, handle something and move forward, handle something and move forward. And then the dogs bark. So I wanted to go investigate my last 50 years. I wanted to go and see are there consistencies that you have practiced that you followed, Matthew, that have led to your success? Are there consistencies that you've practiced that have led to your failures? Um, and I found consistencies in those. Um, and then I also found this as, as I was writing it, you know, for myself, the more personal I got, the more relatable that the stories became, the more that uh, my own personal stories or experiences, people could see themselves in it or analogize something in their own life. If they go, oh, that, that happened to me and this is how I handled it or that happened to me and this is how I did not handle it. Um, so, you know, I wrote it, I had no idea that eight weeks after it being out that it would have translated as, as much and as widely as it has so personally to people. People have been able to make it very subjective in their own lives. Um, and you say it is a parenting book. It is a leadership book. Yes. And I'm 100% on purchase with you about saying, you know, we, 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 we can all do a better job of understanding. We can have leaders. We can have that person in office that we wanted, that we voted in. We can have that boss that we revere. They can't do it for us. We all have to be, we can have, you know, a minister of culture, but we all have to be ministers of our own culture. We are a self-determining species. And uh, I think we need to give ourselves more credit uh, to, to shake hands with that fact. Matthew, you share some very vulnerable, visceral stories around your upbringing, your parents' relationship, um, married to each other three times, divorced from each other two times. You share a lot of pain and a lot of, uh, relatable stories for people who had struggle in their own life. There are some great lessons in the story. I, ha I admit, I have not seen this epic film called Scorpion Spring, but you, <laughs> share, you share a valuable lesson about the power of preparation. Would you take your time and reconstruct what is the lesson that you learn and you share to us? It's a leadership lesson. It's a life it lesson around the power of preparation. Kind of back into it as to why you become a butt full of yourself and then what happened on Scorpion Spring that you now yeah. share with us. <laughs> <laughs> so this is about, I think this is early 90s. I had just finished a film called Boys on the Side. It was a very conservative character. And coming out of that, all the auditions I went on, I'd get a call back once, a call back twice, but then never get the part. And every time I'd leave the audition, I was like, ah, you, did, you left something in the bag. You, you, you didn't take a risk. You kind of gave 85%. Well, all of a sudden I get this blind offer for this film, Scorpion Spring. No audition needed, just you got the part. It's a one day part um, and just come in and do it, Matthew. So I get that part and I decide, you know what, Matthew, you need to go back 
to how you first learned acting, which is in days to confuse. When you didn't know what acting was, you didn't even, that you were had three lines that turned into three weeks work. You just knew your man and went and did and acted as your man would. Well, that's a good idea, I thought. So I said, for this script, Scorpion Spring, I'm not even gonna read the script. I'm not even gonna read the scene because I'm just gonna know the scenario my man is a drug runner on the on the on the southern border in Texas. Coyotes are bringing his drugs over. He's going to take them out, not pay them, and steal the drugs. That's all I need to know, and I'll just go do what my man would do. Right idea, right? Yeah. So I get to the set. I'm on the mark. We're about to shoot that scene that I have not read. I know nothing about. <laughs> the other actors are there. Uh, script. Uh, PA, production assistant, come by and says, Mr. McConaughey, would you like to see the sides? And that's a miniature version of the day scene. And I guess I was feeling a little insecure with my decision to not prepare at all because I said, yeah, let me have a look at those. Thinking, if it's written well, well, this is obviously what my man would say and do. And if it's not written well, I'll just say and do what I would say. Well, I look at page one. I look at page two. I look at page three. <laughs> I look at page four. I then say to no one and everyone in particular, can I get 12 minutes? Now, why did I want 12 minutes? I wanted 12 minutes because I thought that would not be too long to inconvenience the crew. But I also wanted 12 minutes because I thought that might just be enough time for me to memorize a four page monologue in Spanish, that was written, <laughs> that my character's supposed to say in this scene. Ooh, I felt this bead of sweat come up on the back of my neck. And yes, 12 minutes was not enough time to inconvenience the crew, but it was also not enough time to learn a four page monologue in Spanish because, hey, I, uh, I took a semester of Spanish in my sophomore year in high school. So I was thoroughly embarrassed. Um, I was stressed out, I was anxious. Uh, I went and did the scene. I've never watched it. I don't even know what I did. Um, and I didn't tell anyone, oh, I didn't prepare, but I kept it to myself. But from that day forward, I said, no, 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 no. You have to prepare to have the freedom. You have to do the work early. So when you get in the game, you can play. And it was a really, really good lesson that led to many more successes later on. I would argue that that lesson that, the, that fear and discomfort and the embarrassment that I felt from that made me prepare so much for say, the movie A Time to Kill, which I was not offered the role of Jake Brigance. I was offered another much smaller role. But when I went to the director's meeting to talk to him about that very small role, I had already read the script up and down. I had read the book up and down. And I knew that I wanted to actually to go for the lead of Jake Brigance and was ready to tell the director why I should be that. And that worked out. It wouldn't have worked out if I wouldn't have prepared that much and been that ready to do that in that, in that meeting with Joel Schumacher for A Time to Kill. That would have happened maybe, I wouldn't have taken that much time to prepare if I hadn't been so damn embarrassed about what I, how I didn't prepare for Scorpion Spring. Matthew, you didn't share it in the book and maybe for a reason. So when you got back after the 12 minutes, did you deliver your lines in Spanish? Do you recall? Do you not want to share? What's the punchline? <laughs> I've blanked it out in okay. my mind. All I don't right. know. I know it was at least some sort of yo, por que yo lo valgo. It was not, it couldn't have been very good Spanish. I promise you that. <laughs> um, hey, you mentioned a time to kill and you've talked a bit about the serendipity of sometimes, you know, green lights fall in your lap. But I think it's in the book where you write about how you know you went from a life of uh, obscurity to a life of worldwide fame in a week. In a weekend. In a weekend. Would you just recreate that experience for our listeners and viewers and talk a bit about how you have kept yourself grounded since that weekend pivot point from living in sure. obscurity to living sure. as one of the most ugly famous people in the world? It was wild and it happened so acutely. And that's why I interrupted and said it was over a weekend. It was over 48 hours, actually. So the Friday before the film A Time to Kill opened, or actually the Friday of, it was going to open up that, that evening. And it was that Friday. I'm walking down Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica, California. There's 400 people in the promenade. 395 are minding their own business. No one's looking at me. Five of them are looking at me. A couple of girls who maybe thought I was cute and a couple of guys who thought I had cool shoes on. 
Um, I went to go get my tuna sandwich as I like to do. And the world was as it, as, as it had always been. Also on a, on a uh, professional level, you know, there was a, a hundred scripts out there that I wanted to do. And the answer was 99 no's, but one yes. I'll do anything to do any hundred of those scripts. I'll do anything. Now, Time to Kill opens up Friday night. It does well. It does well Saturday. It does well Sunday. Monday comes. 48 hours later, I walk down the same promenade to go get my same tuna sandwich. 400 people are on the promenade. But this time, 395 are staring at me and five aren't. And one of those five are blind. Everybody's looking at me. I'm checking my nose, my fly. What just happened? The world just inverted. How did the world just become a mirror? What just went on? At the same time, those hundred scripts I wanted to do that 48 hours previous were 99 no's and one yes, inverted. 99 yeses, please do this. Please take this role, Matthew. Wait a minute. 48 hours ago, I would have done anything to do any of them. And now you're telling me I can basically do all of them? You want me to be discerning right now? You want me to decide which one is the best for me when just two days ago I would have done any of them and now you're telling me I can do all of them? Overwhelming. Um, I noticed on the promenade that, ah, I just became famous. Ah, and what I noticed from going forward there is after that weekend, I, it's extremely rare for me to meet a stranger. Meaning before that weekend, I meet you, we say hi, we, yeah, we get going talking, you hear I have a dog barking in the background, you ask about the dog, I tell you about the dog. It's part of our conversation. Well, after that weekend, I have people coming up to me going like, oh my God, I'm so sorry about Miss Hud, Matthew. I've never met this person, number one. I also wonder how they know I had a dog. Number two, how they know her name was Miss Hud. Number four, how they know she had cancer. Whoa, you just skipped four salutations uh, of getting, getting to know you. Um, so everyone, the world immediately had a biography, some sense of a biography of me. So I wasn't meeting strangers anymore and I had really no anonymity. Um, so to lead into how I dealt with that and how I dealt with it then, I got out of town. <laughs> I went away uh, to a monastery for a while and then I went off on a, on a solo trek through Peru. I, I went to Peru because um, I had a dream that led me there, but it was also a place where I, I went to places where there was no electricity, where no one would know my name. They did not even speak the same language. I needed to go away to hear myself think. I needed to go away to let memory catch up with me. All of a sudden the roof had been taken off my life. And in that happening, my feet felt a little off the ground mm. and I needed to have some semblance to at least grab my compass and let my let myself listen to myself. I have opinions on things, let myself decide what matters to me and what doesn't. What what matters in this world of Hollywood now that everyone's saying, oh, we love you and will you do will you do my film when two days ago they didn't wouldn't let me do their film? What 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 matters? How much how much of what they're saying is true and how much is not? Where can I cut the chafe here? And I needed my own time to decide for that and have some discernment. And it's been a very valuable thing for me to go off into solitude. Um, and I think it's a very valuable thing for all of us. I know not all of us can afford to sit there and go, hey, I'm going to take a 22 day backpack trip with myself to Peru, but even on a daily maintenance level, even if it's five minutes here and there, just try to have a little solitude. People do it, you know, through prayer, through meditation, through exercise, through taking a walk, through just going off to a quiet space and sitting there and going, I'm not really going to think of anything. I just need to sit here. And I find that in doing that, it puts demarcations between all of our responsibilities. And if we don't have the demarcations in between, the events of our day, responsibilities of our day, the things that are on our proverbial desk, they start to stack up in a vertical manner on our proverbial shoulders and we start to feel the weight of them. And I find that if we can take a little time out, a little time for ourselves, a little solitude to get the view of everything we have, our responsibilities, what we want to do, those things that feel vertical and are, and are, and are putting weight on our shoulders suddenly lay horizontal and it's much easier and less stressful to get what you need to get done when it's laid out in front of you than when it's stacked on top of you. Matthew, a big part of your book 
resonates with this concept of gratitude, right? You were raised by your parents to be enormously grateful. You talk about it a lot on many of the interviews you've done for this book, even prior to this book. Our co-founder, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, who you know wrote the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of the concepts he popularized is this term called an abundance mentality. I think it describes mm. you well. You are a very abundant person, whether it be with your resources, your fame, your love, you, you often turn the spotlight on to other people. You share a great story in the book about you and some buddies going abroad and renting some um, motorcycles for a few weeks. Will you share that story in detail and then make sure you hit the punchline on how it relates to an abundance mentality by the, um, by the vendor? I, I sure will. Um, before I get into that, I'd like to piggyback. You just gave me an idea that abundance mentality. I, I'm working on a theory right now um, that I was inspired by my uh, conversation with my pastor, that generosity breeds gratitude mm. and gratitude actually breeds responsibility. Responsibility breeds freedom. I'm, link, I'm working on a theory that links those, those four and it all starts with generosity, which mm. is where more synonymous with, the, with abundance mentality. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a time when I just moved out to Hollywood. Um, this is pre time to kill. This is me driving my U-Haul out to Hollywood with 2000 bucks to sleep on the couch of a friend, the only guy I knew in LA. And I got $2,000 and I need a job. Um, as I'm needing a job, starting to notice that my funds are going down. <laughs> I go to my friend who was the man who could give me access to go into meeting an agent. Cause I couldn't meet, get an agent meeting on my own. And one night over, over dinner, I've been there, been there about two and a half weeks. I go to him, I go, Don, I go in, I go, can you get me a meeting with an agent? Man, I need, I need, I need, to, I need to get a meeting. And he snapped at me. He yelled and cussed me out. And basically what he told me was, if this town, Hollywood, smells just you needy, smells anybody needy, you're done. What you need to do is get the hell out of here go off somewhere and quit thinking about trying to get a dog on agent and trying to get a job because you're too needy right now. So I knew he meant it and saw the wisdom in what he was saying immediately. So I got, I hooked up with a couple of good buddies and we got economy class tickets to Amsterdam, a little cash in our back pocket. And we said, let's go. Our dream was to go ride motorcycles across Europe. Well, in Rosenheim, Germany, we came across this motorcycle shop, beautiful motorcycle shop and met the owner called Johan. And he and his wife were there and we told him what we wanted to do. We wanted to ride across Europe. And he pulls up these beautiful bikes, brand new bikes. Uh, um, and we look at him and go, this is great. Yeah, but, but how much is this going to cost? And the cost is going to be like twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. And we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, no, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. We have, to, we have to downscale quite a bit because we don't even have $1,200 dollars to, to spend. Is there any possibility of anything? Do you have any old, old bikes that we could borrow? He then said, as he looked at us and he saw himself in us, he goes, you know, when I was your age, I rode with my friends across Europe. It was one of the greatest trips of my life. And I don't know if I'd be the man I am today if I didn't do that. He goes, you three young men need these bikes. You three men need to take these bikes across Europe. And I remember saying, but we don't have, I mean, it's, 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 it's inappropriate. We don't even have a, a, a tenth of what, of what you're asking for. His wife was not very pleased at where this, where this negotiation was going either. Um, but he goes, no, it's not about that. You're taking, you're taking these brand new bikes. And I said, you know what, for all we can do is, is, is pay you like this 800 bucks and give you our return plane tickets you know, uh, from Amsterdam for three weeks from now as insurance. He said, I don't need the money. I don't need the tickets. Now his wife said, give me your return ticket as insurance. <laughs> okay. But he rolled the bikes out. We went out and rode. We rode for three weeks at about week two and a half. My, my, my friend Rory, who had a Ducati laid it down doing about a hundred miles an hour on an autobahn, totaled the bike. All he all Roy came away with was a few scratches and a night in the emergency room. But he totaled this brand new Ducati bike. I mean, that was, I don't know how many thousand dollars that brand new bike was. Totaled it. We call Johan. 
We're down in Sestra Levante in Italy, Johan. Uh, Rory dropped the bike. It's totaled. His first words were, where are you exactly? Where's the bike? We told him at this intersection getting off the Autobahn where Rory had wrecked it. He says, I'll be there tomorrow. Are you okay? Or he said, yeah, I'm okay. He goes, okay, I'll be there tomorrow, 2 p.m. The next day, we're out in this field with this total Ducati waiting for Johan or someone to show up and pick it up. And who does show up in a big cargo van? Johan. As he pulls up, we start to lift the bike to obviously load it in the back of the van. But before we can do that, Johan goes to the back of the cargo van and unloads another brand new Ducati, just like the one Roy just totaled. Whoa. He unloads that. We load up the totaled one and he just tells us, keep riding, keep riding. You are supposed to ride. I'm just glad you're okay. The bike is a bike. I'm glad you're okay. Keep riding. Well, we did. And it was one of the greatest trips ever. We got great stories and great closer to those two friends and still very close to them today because of that trip together. Now I came back to Hollywood and I, we'd been gone three and a half weeks a month. I hadn't thought of getting an agent. I hadn't thought of acting. I hadn't thought, I didn't, need, I didn't need Hollywood. I wasn't even thinking about it. I just had stories to tell. And I was back sleeping on the couch with the same guy, Don Phillips, who told me, you need to get the hell out of here. And a few days went by and we're having dinner again. And all of a sudden at dinner, he goes, you're ready. And I go, for what? And he goes, tomorrow morning, we got a meeting, William Morris. You're ready to go into the agency because you want it, but you don't need it. Keep that in mind tomorrow's meeting. We went in, I was relaxed. I was able to be myself. I was involved in the conversation. I was not live or die by the conversation. I wasn't begging them to take me on as a client. I was myself. They signed me that day. And the first two auditions they got me in Hollywood, I got the job. Matthew, what did the German Ducati experience instill in you as a father, as a spouse, as a producer, an actor, philanthropist, as a unifier, that abundance mentality that he yeah. showed with you, how does that infuse how you live your life? Well, my first thing that comes to mind is as a father, you know, I've got three children like you do. And, you know, we, we, we don't, we'd be remiss to put everything, more of everything in front of them that they may want, because some of those things they may want, they, they may not, they may not really need. Um, some of those things are just sort of fads in their mind. But boy, when you have a child that has something that they are into, that they believe in, that they want to get better at, that they want to work at, that they have an innate ability for. Boy, I like to be generous on that account and give them abundance of that. Keep putting fuel on that fire. Keep putting the things in front of them that they can grow and become better at and maybe one day master or become an expert at. That, uh, when you see, you know, that's what Johan saw in us. And it wasn't an occupation, but it was a dream. And it was, it was, it was youth. And he saw three friends together and he had experience in his own life and was still friends with the, the friends in his life that he took the road trip with when he was our age and his value system. Look at what he valued. He valued that he lost money on the deal. And he we totaled a bike, but he valued, he understood what, what, what we could get out of it. And you know, I think in us offering, and he saw that we were genuine, we were never gonna steal the bikes, but we were. he didn't care, he didn't need insurance to even have our return ticket. Again, his wife did, but he didn't. <laughs> um, that was great abundance that he gave. So I think in all those sort of categories that you said, and the ones I explained on fatherhood especially, to put in front of people, you know, give, the, give people the fishing rod. You know, they actually like it more than the fish. <laughs> they actually remember it. They'll remember the story of catching the fish, even if it takes them hours to catch it, much more than they'll remember the, 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 the great fish platter if you just serve it to them. Um, so he gave us, uh, um, well, he gave us fish and fishing rod, actually. Um, but to, to put those things that, 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 that are healthy and constructive that people can feed and grow through um, is always, I think, a good idea. 
that if we can have someone that generally wants something um, and, gen and, and, and generally believes in something to give them that opportunity, it's sort of like uh, it, it's opportunity really is what it is. This is why I say this is a phenomenal leadership book. Uh, Matthew, five quick questions. Uh, you spend a lot of time thinking. You're a unifier. You're a very thoughtful person. I don't know you personally, but now after I read your book, I feel like I know you more. Um, I'm going to ask you five questions, and, and tell me what you think first comes to your mind. Um, yes, sir. People spend too much time worried about what? People spend too much time worried about yesterday. What's the biggest lesson you've learned in your life? biggest lesson that I've learned in my life. Oh boy, I've learned a bunch. Let me go ahead and give you- uh, um, You can give me a couple. One of my, one of my favorites. Um, and this came to me via a friend of mine who was with his great grandfather on spring break in college. His great grandfather was like 95. And my friend who was my roommate comes back from spring break. He's like, man, I, had, I learned something really, really cool spring break. I'm like what? And he goes, I asked my great grandpa, I said, I said, what's the best advice you can give me? And here's what he said. He says, he says, I've had thousands of crises in my life. And most of them never happened. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> that's a beauty. That's a beauty. <laughs> also, um, you know, when we can, and especially this is constructive for us as a, as a collective people going forward. And it's a little bit of uh, it's a little bit of forgiveness, and it's a trick that unties the knot in contradictions and actually lets people uh, heal. Which is, um, if you're not sure how to respond, please make sense of humor the default emotion. A little laughter does not deny the crisis. It actually can be what opens and unties the knot to 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 fixing the crisis. That story reminds me of one of the beautiful accolades you gave to your mother. I think it was your mom, where you share early on in the book about how your mom took lots of worries to sleep but forgot about them over the night. Will you recreate that little <laughs> adage for us? <laughs> I'm well, getting it wrong. But. Now she's committed, okay? I now, now, now my mother is, is, is a little different than me. She is an example of the value of denial if you're truly committed to it, <laughs> and she is. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my mom, I tell you, you know, a few years ago, my mom's 80, 88, back to 89 in you know, two weeks. And I say to her, because she's in great shape, really sharp mentally, zero stress. I'm like, mom, do you have things that when you go to bed at night, do you make a, a list in your mind of things that you regret or things you could have done better that day or things you, you want to improve on? Or and she's like, oh, honey. Oh, every night I have to make a mental list. It's usually like 20, 25 things that I know I should do better, that I regret that I did. And I said, okay. She goes, but honey, the thing is, when I wake up in the morning, I forgot them all. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, Matthew, the book is a masterpiece. You are such a genuine storyteller. Uh, two more questions, and then we'll finish. I know your time is precious with your family and your healing meniscus. Um, what's one of the biggest lies you were taught early in your life that you learned later in life was not true? Ah, that's a good one. Let me think of a good answer. Let me tell you this one. And this, you know, there's, there's, we all, as, as fathers and as parents, we know this. Our kids ask us questions sometimes, and it, we instinctually go, oh, I better have a great answer because I'm about to, what I say here is gonna be written in the lineage yeah. of this child. You know, that they're gonna take it literally and it's gonna reshape their perspective of the world. Well, I asked um, the principal of our school, I was in kindergarten, a question on the corner of Getty Street in Uvalde, Texas. I was looking up at a cloud. When you look at a cloud, it, was a, it, was a, it had shape, it had form, I could see the outside of it. And his name was Mr. Mayor. I said, Mr. Mayor, uh, how, how, how big is that cloud? Is it, as, and he, is it as big as the world? And he goes, yes, Matthew, that cloud's as big as the world. Now, what did that do to me? That made me from that day on go, well, I'd rather be a sailor than an astronaut because an astronaut's just too wild of an idea. It's too far out there because I know that it takes us 
for instance, in my, I'm a kid as a kindergartner, I'm like, well, I know it takes us, you know, 15 hours to drive to Florida for the weekend summer vacation. And, you know, and that's, I look at the map, that's only that far on a map that on a globe that's that big. I mean, if it takes that far to get there, but I'm looking at this cloud and I can see the outline, that must mean that that cloud is so far away that it's unattainable. And then I also got my first plane ride, got on a jet. Well, what happens when you, when you take off in a jet? In the first five minutes, you're in a cloud. And so in my mind, I'm going, oh, wait a minute. If that cloud was that far away and we're five minutes off the ground and we're already in the cloud in a jet, this jet must be able to go a billion miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 what it did, it didn't dampen my dreams, but it made me, for instance, my analogy has always been like, hey, from that day on, I was always like, no, I'm in the Army, not the Air Force. I want to deal with what's on the ground because that's practical. Mm. I want to deal with what's practical mm. and right in front of me because that up there is just too far to even consider. So just deal with what's on the ground. Again, be a sailor rather than an astronaut. Well, of course, as I get older, I uh, find out that, no, that cloud's not as big as the world. That cloud's actually right over there. It's not even as big as this, you know, this, this little neighborhood. Um, and... I had times in my life where I was like, damn it, Mr. Mayor, why'd you tell me that? But then most of the time I'm like, I'm kind of glad he told me that because it settled me into thinking you better deal with what's in front of you. You have to deal with what's in front of you. And even if you go down a path you've already taken, it's a different path because it's another time. Or even if you retrace a path that you went and you go back, you come back the other way it's a different journey because you're coming at it from the other direction. Um, so it sort of opened up my imagination uh, as a young kid and still to this day in seeing beauty and creativity and possibilities and opportunities right here in every relationship, in my backyard, across the street, um, in, across the state, across the nation, across this globe. And that's enough for me. Um, so that's one of the things I learned was not true. Huh but did sort of shape my perspective very early on and still does to a large extent. Matthew, we'll finish up. Um, flip the script. What's the biggest truth you dismissed outright that have now learned you should not have? The biggest truth that I dismissed? Oh, man, man, what's a good one that I dismissed early? Let me think. Um, Your parents taught you a lot of lessons. Much of the book is dedicated to Lessons taught to you by Well, let me father. tell you this one. I'll tell you one that I'm going to flip it on, Ted. I go to 1977. I'm eight years old. I enter the Little Mr. Texas contest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I get up there. I ride a horse out. I do an interview, talk about 4-H, how what I know about farming, ranching, et cetera, et cetera. Say my yes ma'ams and yes sirs, et cetera. Tip my hat. All of a sudden, next thing I know, I got a trophy in my hand. I'm taking a picture. Wow. We go home. My mom put that picture of me holding that trophy right there in the kitchen where every morning when I walk to, to, to breakfast, she points, she goes, look at you, there you are. You are little Mr. Texas, Matthew. Little Mr. Texas, you are. That's 1977. So I saw that every day all the way up through 1988 because that's when I finished high school. Every morning I heard that and saw that. I'm little Mr. Texas. So let's cut to 2018. <laughs> <laughs> starting to write this book. I'm going through journals. I come across this picture that I had a, now a digital picture of this picture of me holding this trophy, Little Mr. Texas. Something catches my eye on the nameplate of the trophy. I zoom in on it and it says runner up. <laughs> <laughs> would I would I be here with the life I have if I would grown up thinking I was runner up, Scott? I don't know. Matthew, so sometimes, yeah, sometimes a good malaprop can send some people in a, in, a, in a good way. Matthew, I think it is fair to say you are a unifier. I have watched many podcasts and interviews with you in a time of massive division, pain, crisis, trauma in our country, in our world. You are a unifier. What's next for you? What can you do? How can you inspire through your own it's, modeling it's, to, to help us? It's a great question, and um, I'm looking for that answer myself. I, um, I want to step in the most useful role of leadership that I can. I don't know what that is. I've, 
you know, people dangle out politics. I don't understand. Uh, politics for me still needs to redefine its purpose. I also, I'm also not interested in being in a position that many politicians are that you go put some band-aids on some things and then those band-aids are ripped off as soon as you're out of office and there was really no real evolution in the whole thing. I'm going to go back to what you said when we started uh, this conversation. You know, when we talk about when we have our leaders um, and it's like we get our leader that we voted for or we want or we want to follow and they get us to stick, get up out of our chair and come to the edge of the porch and go, yes, I'm with you. And then as soon as they're in position to lead and as soon as they've been nominated or whatever that is, we usually go sit back down and go, ah, good. We're good now. He or she's got it. No, we got to get off the porch. We can't, they can't, no, a number of our leaders can't do it for us. It starts with you and I in the mirror. And if you or I individually, if you and I individually, and everyone individually looks in the mirror and says, I'm going to be a little bit better today at this, whatever that value is, I'm going to be a little more fair, a little more generous, a little more abundant, a little more accountable, a little more responsible. I'm going to have a better sense of humor, whatever that is. If each one of us individually says we're going to incrementally get a little bit better, that's how we make a collective change. That's the epidemic that we want, that we don't want a vaccine for, a value epidemic right there. But and we have to know, we know it, but we don't admit it. It's personal. Um, and I think once we realize, and you said, I mean, uh, you use the word unifier, we got to understand that these things like responsibility and freedom and wants and needs and selfishness and selflessness are not contradictions. They're actually a paradox. There's a place where the best choice for you is the best choice for the most amount of people. There's a place where the best choice for me is the best choice for we. Every one of us can make a decision that the most selfless decision is actually the most selfless decision. The most selfless decision is actually the most selfish decision. So when we quit making these contradictions and look at our politics now, red and blue, great contradiction. They illegitimize the other side. Yeah. They invalidate yeah. the other side. They make the other side persona non grata, obliviatum, you don't exist. Well, so now you're stuck with 50-50. Uh, we, we've, got to, we've got to bond social contracts again, and it starts with you and I in the mirror. Matthew, you don't need to sell any more books that you would invest 45 minutes and come on and talk to us about leadership, parenting, this unification. Uh, you are a manifestation of the abundance mentality. Thank you, sir, for your time. The book is Green Lights, hilarious, tender, raw, uh, some parts relatable, some parts not, but what a <laughs> gift your book has been. Uh, is deserving for it. I hear the audio book is like all the rage. I own a couple copies. My wife and I, Stephanie, are reading it together in bed each night still, uh, second round, but I hear the audio book is phenomenal. Thank you, sir, for your time. Such a gift. I appreciate it. You are welcome. I quite enjoyed it anytime. Wow, what a discussion today. Matthew McConaughey, pick up a copy of Green Lights. Uh, great leadership book, great self-leadership book. We'll see you back here next week with another guest on Leadership. Leadership.